I am Andris Kulikowskas. This is Math for Wisdom. I have guests, uh, uh, physicist Thomas Gaidosik from Vilnius University in Lithuania, and mathematician John Harlan from Palomar College in California. I will be talking about uh, new ideas regarding the combinatorics of the Schrodinger equation. But I wanted to start off with some of the interests of John, please. Oh, okay. So, you know, I'm I'm learning uh, about Bell's inequality or revisiting Bell's inequalities and and non-locality of quantum mechanics. So, it, you know, you can advance non-local hidden variables um, theories that give you the statistics predicted by quantum mechanics, but I uh, I would like to uh, understand more about these non-local hidden variables theories because I think there's some rather bizarre consequences that one would have to accept. In particular, um, I'm pursuing, you know, one, one consequence could be that just by mere presence of a measuring device, you could change the statistics of a of an experiment without ever activating that device. And so this kind of has the, uh, you know, I, 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 that's my that's my hypothesis. I'm, I don't I don't have proof of that, but uh, I call that an agency machine where you just mere presence of a measuring device changes the statistics. And you can create um, kind of kludged up uh, non-local theories where you have retrograde uh, time uh, motion and change the past in such a way that you can create an agency machine like this. It's not hard to dream such things up, but you know it's a rather exotic kind of construct. And I'd like to know that whether uh, a non-local uh, hidden variables theory without without retrograde time, just just you know the presence of non-local hidden variables. Um, Give, gives rise to a uh, this agency phenomenon. In other words, if you can create cer certain cer certain superpositions of quantum states in involving non-local hidden variables, then you can create something that has this kind of agency, um, uh, this agency property that just presence of a measuring device changes the statistics without ever activating that device. So. There's a, there there is kind of an analog to to the Bohm Aharonov effect where you you do have to activate a device and it changes the statistics of a measurement, but the the things you're measuring don't pass through the space of the device itself. Um, in other words, the device is remote, and so um, but this is a little bit different. This is this is almost like mimicking retrograde time uh, with this agency machine. And I, I'm wondering if that kind of weirdness exists with these non-local hidden variable series. So that's that's kind of what what, what my my most recent days of thinking, that's where, where I'm at right now. Um, so I'll hand it I, over I, to you. Yes, and I would ask Thomas if I know that this is a very... Uh, well, not, far out what John is researching, and I applaud him for it. Uh, John and I, I will say, uh, have been studying quantum mechanics uh, for the last two years together. We met at graduate school at the University of California, San Diego. And uh, so I, he is super passionate about physics, and I had a chance to study a little bit from Griffith's book, and that got me off on the journey that I'll talk about today. Uh, but I wanted to ask Thomas also. Thomas, I met in Vilnius, uh, where I uh, live in. I live in Lithuania, and uh, he's been kind enough to um, be a person I could talk to about uh, philosophy and uh, physics and math. Uh, and so he's seen me grow in this area. So uh, just maybe to start off, Thomas, do you have any thoughts on what John just said? I think it's an amazing question. The difficulty for me is how to envision it really as a physical system because it yeah. should be i think more as a mathematical construction and there i have no clue 
I'm gladly listening. I would gladly learn, but it's and too this far is a way for my everyday experience to some extent to say I could have an intuition already there. And I just want to thank both of you. I uh, thank God along with him. And and uh, just to say, like, uh, one reason I'm, you know, we agreed to record this, and this is in the public domain uh, for all to share and, and to use as they think best, but it's to invite more people to be part of this community. My own goal is to uh, have a language of cognitive frameworks to show that it can be relevant for questions like this. Uh, but uh, in general, for questions of advanced mathematics, uh, and that can be a validation uh, of that. So. Um, so then I will begin my presentation. Uh, I will be talking about the combinatorics of the Schrodinger equation. And I started um, being interested in this when uh, John uh, said I could join him in studying from Griffith's textbook, which we both highly recommend, uh, in terms of a book that really lets you calculate the way that uh, quantum mechanics uh, uh, people calculate. I just want to show, though, also have, uh, I found there's a quantum mechanics book uh, in Lithuanian. This is just a plug for how great Lithuania is as a country, but I bought this book. Uh, it's a uh, quantity physica. It's a textbook, you know, you can see. So yeah. just the fact that uh, there are quantum mechanics being taught in Lithuania is a great thing. Uh, I should do that. Um, so my background is in algebraic combinatorics. Uh, and so when I saw the orthogonal polynomials uh, in the solutions of the Schrodinger equation, I thought, hmm, what could they possibly be uh, calculating in terms of combinatorial objects? So the hypothesis I'm going to be exploring is um, that physical solutions to the Schrodinger equation and their analogs in quantum field theory are only given by uh, those with orthogonal Schefter polynomials. And that that physics can be comprehended. We can make a lot of progress by looking at how the combinatorics works. That's my that's my crazy hypothesis that I've been working on. And so there's three inspirations that are coming into this mix. One is uh, that Hermite and Laguerre polynomials appear in the Schrodinger equation uh, as solutions in uh, respectively the cases of the quantum harmonic oscillator and the radial component of the hydrogen atom. So they do happen. They do show up. Now, I have a PhD uh, from the University of California, San Diego in algebraic combinatorics. And so this idea of trying to interpret what could those numbers mean uh, is just something second nature to me. And it uh, fits with my philosophical uh, perspective. Is, and what it does, um, it gives a way of uh, adding interpretation to mathematics. That mathematics is not just symbols and not just middling symbols, but there can be ways of thinking about objects that kind of come in with that. So the kind of question that uh, John started off with, like, well, what would it mean to be doing a measurement? What would it mean to be introducing a measurement-capable instrument into an environment? How could that possibly affect uh, the outlooks, right? I would say that's a question of interpretation, or at least those are the types of things I'll be explaining, how they show up in the math that I'll be presenting. And then the third source is... Um, my interest in cognitive frameworks and having a language uh, for knowing everything, which would be like a language for mastering our own cognitive frameworks, uh, all that they could possibly uh, tell us. And one of those frameworks for decision making is fivefold. There's five perspectives, and uh, they uh, they can be conceived in space, they can be conceived in time, but basically they set up causality in two different directions. And I, I say it like this: that every effect has had its cause, but not every cause has had its effect. And so there's a critical point for deciding. So I have a picture of that down here further. Um, and then, so this is the, well, I call it the five sum. And there's a three sum, a four sum, a two sum, a six sum, a seven sum. There's actually eight uh, such mental states basically. And if you're in a mental state of decision-making, you need five different things to be available for you to be uh, thinking about for you to be interpreting in terms of. But if you want to conceive this uh, holistic structure, you need to pick a vantage point. So you'll either pick a temporal vantage point, in which case the cause is in the past and the effect is in the future. Um, and you can have a restricted past and future, like we could say like maybe a near past and future, 
or you could have a distant past and future. And then the present is where those both directions are available. But you can also think of causality spatially so that uh, you have um, uh, a super system with the cause and a subsystem with the effect. And the boundary is the mediating point. And, um, and perhaps like in the case of time, the present lets you relate ambiguously the two different directions. But in the case of space, it may be that the boundary kind of separates causality, you know, the cause from the effect. So the point being that this is something I have uh, that other people don't have. And the idea is that in my framework, that's really all the physics should boil down to that. That's kind of hard to believe, you know, that that's basically like the model for the continuum. For the continuum, you need to have that type of thing. So it's quite surprising that at least as far as quantum physics goes, that that goes, that will go a far away um, uh, in that I'll be talking about that. But also that, uh, uh, and that'll come out through uh, the five-fold classification of the uh, orthogonal Schefter polynomials, which also matches up to the five-fold classification of uh, uh, natural exponential families with quadratic variance functions, uh, which uh, basically gives uh, the most usual probability uh, distributions, probability density functions. And I just learned of a book called The Book of Why by uh, Judea Pearl, and he studies uh, causal inference in statistics, and he applies that in artificial intelligence, you know, and how we can have artificial scientists and things like that. So that all, uh, uh, and his book, uh, which is exciting for me to start reading, but he talks about correlation, how it's distinct from causality, but he also talks about um, uh, levels of, that there's a level of intervention, but there's also a level of uh, contrafactuals. And so I think that those two levels are similar, like these two directions. So like intervention would be in terms of what is, you know, the, the, the effects that are have causes that were. But contrafactuality is kind of like in the other direction, like, you know, what did not happen had effects that did not happen. The causes did not happen. Well, you know, so not every cause has had its effects. It's kind of contrafactual in that sense. I'm not sure, but that really seems on the same mark. So uh, those are the three inspirations for my work, and I'll proceed to talk about uh, uh, my findings, but maybe just to stop for any comments or questions at this point. Okay, so then I'll Not continue. Really. Yeah. Not really. So then I'll continue. Um, what, where I'm at, and I've been working on this for two years, um, but uh, okay, so I got interested in the sorry, sorry, Andre. So I was I was asking a question, but I, I was on mute. So um, go ahead. What's your question? Yeah. So just for clarification, you would like to come at physics from a a different point of view, like a completely different point of view that's more based on a finite combinatorial model. Is that correct? Um, yes. So the idea that like. Presently, physics mathematically depends on the notion of a continuum. And so I kind of find that a little bit fictional. You know, like I don't see really any, be I don't find it real and I don't find any really any basis for it. I don't really find it makes sense in our universe like that. That would be something that just seems a lot of over overhead, nothing really may be gained. And so I just find this a discrete mathematics would be uh, just somehow more attractive. And so... Um, and more plausible and just more maybe easier i don't know but that's uh that's just okay. my instinct is to that's my and maybe another just simply to say like that's my tool chest you know i'm able to think in terms of that but i think that uh, one of the things that and maybe geometry like you have algebra and you have analysis and i would say i think of geometry as an interface between the two but basically you can say the same things algebraically and analytically maybe and um and you they're just happening in parallel. There's these parallel ways to approach it. But the idea being that a, a continuum is like an idealization. It's not a reality. You know, it may be very useful idealization, but it's just ideal. It's not really real in the in the way. So that's my prejudice was probably my bias. Um, does that answer your question more or less? Or? Okay. Yes, thanks. Okay, so... What I'd like to be able to do, this is quite ambitious, but to be able to give a combinatorial interpretation of things like this. So um, if I have the Hamiltonian, which is basically like an operator version of the energy, 
and I have a wave function. And then I have this uh, measurement of the Hamiltonian, which would be basically the expected value of the Hamiltonian, which would be the energy measurement, if that's hopefully. I've been rehearsing with Thomas, but I hope that's basically correct. And the way you'd calculate is that you'd have a wave function. Uh, you would um, uh, operate on it with a Hamiltonian, and then you would um, multiply it by the conjugate uh, wave function, and then you would integrate it across the dx, and then that would give you your expected value. So the question is, what would it mean to do that combinatorially? That just seems kind of hairy. So there's three things involved. Um, one is to get a combinatorial interpretation of the wave function. But um, most, the wave function, like for the case of the Hermite, I mean, for the case of the quantum harmonic oscillator, is going to be composed, it'll be basically look like something like this. You'll have a constant, you'll have a, a, a orthogonal polynomial, and then you'll have what I call like a mother function, uh, or like, a, I'll end up calling it like a space-time wrapper. But so you have this uh, e to the negative uh, constant times x squared. So in physics, this is the wave function, but I'll be saying that really what's really should be separating this uh, polynomial, which is storing combinatorial information, and this uh, mother function, which really should be considered part as a weight function that's part of the uh, inner product. You know, there'd be like a w dx here, let's say, and so that, uh, would, that this would be the w. And you'd be integrating against that. And that would be what I call a space-time wrapper. It just really kind of is at the end when you're giving your measurement, uh, then it kind of comes into place. But otherwise, it's not really even, since it's not even really real. Um, so that's the first uh, distinction. But I'll try to give a combinatorics. So first of all, of these orthogonal polynomials. Second, I'll give a combinatorics of what it means for the Hamiltonian to act on this, uh, maybe not the whole wave function, but just act on the polynomial in a certain sense. So I'll give a different way to think about that. And then third, what it means to do this integration, which is basically like an inner product, but that'll be called a linearization. So like if you put in an X to the K and you had like integral of X to the K times weight function DX, and you could explain what happens to the X to the K, then you could explain what happens to any function you might be interested in, more or less. So those three things I will describe. And I've been working on that. And finally, they're coming together. Uh, and the thing, the reason it came together, um, and a lot of this is just technical morass, um, where you have a recursion, rec recurrence relation for uh, these orthogonal polynomials. I'm choosing to write it this way. And I needed to match it up with, let's say, a uh, formula like this which we'll get to, and just that, you know, I don't understand, I mean, finding these old papers, uh, like uh, the paper by Sheffer in 1939, Isidore Sheffer from America, it turns out five years earlier, uh, there was a paper by uh, Josef Meixner uh, from 1934. That's a very elegant paper. It's in German, but it turns out that uh, uh, there's a recent, uh, two years ago or three years ago in 2019, um, there are, um, I'll get their names right here, they're down here, uh, Butzer, Paul Butzer and Tom Kornwinder, Joseph Meixner, and his life and his orthogonal polynomials. Uh, they give like three pages where they give the derivation. It's understandable, a little bit terse. I went through that a little bit last week with John. But how can I say, um, it's... Um, Maybe I'll just say it now because it's always on my mind. Uh, historically, so Meixner was an accomplished theoretical physicist. He was a young man. Uh, he had a uh, colleague who was uh, Jewish. Uh, I think it's Solomon Bachner. And uh, they worked together on the Hermite case. So they, they were interested. Uh, so let's go to this formula right here. This is basically, there's different ways of defining the Sheffer polynomials, but one way to define them uh, if their p sub n of x is to have this exponential generating function, and then to say for them to be Sheffer polynomials, they need to fit together in this form. A of t is an infinite series times e to the x u of t. u of t is another infinite series. And so those are the Sheffer polynomials. They fit nicely into this exponential arrangement. 
So one example is the Hermite polynomials, in which case U of T is trivial. It's just T. A of T, I think, is rather simple too. And so what they found in that case is that, okay, if you have a something of that form, where it would be like A of T times E to the X T, then they determined that the only polynomials that would work would be the Hermite polynomials if you wanted it to be orthogonal. So there's two constraints here. One is the exponentiality, but the additional constraint is orthogonality. So then uh, Bachner went, it was, it was bad, you know, it was 1932. Bachner said, I should leave, you know, Germany because uh, the Nazis coming into power. And Meixner said, I should leave too. And Bachner said, no, no, uh, uh, there's... Uh, you'll be fine here, but we should save all those jobs for Jewish people, basically. He said that, not in those words, but... So, uh, Meixner stayed, and he worked on uh, generalizing this, uh, e to the x u of t, how to classify it. He came up with a five-fold classification that I'll try to discuss at least the, the results, what they imply. But in 1934, he joined um, the brown shirts. It was the uh, SA. It was the Nazi party paramilitary. And then that then he became like a lecturer. And then three years later, he became, uh, oh, he was an assistant. And three years later, he became a lecturer. And he coincided more or less with him joining the Nazi party that year. Then he went into the army. He served in Norway, I am sure. Uh, and then um, finally in 1943, they let him um, be a researcher again. And then after the war, his advisor Sommerfeld was, um, was uh, one of the very few Germans who was definitely anti-Nazi. And his advisor wrote a letter that uh, let him get a denazification certification. So he continued his career. And, and uh, for example, there's the meixner polacek polynomials. Uh, po later on, the Polacek was another uh, Jew who escaped the Holocaust, uh, as far as I know. So uh, it's nice that they gave that history. It's And because of our, like, work for peace for Russia and Ukraine, this notion of denazification, like these polynomials are named after a Nazi, you know, now it's a denazified Nazi. What does that mean? But like when Vladimir Putin wants denazification, like uh, maybe it would help to have a discussion like, well, should we denazify these Meixner polynomials? You know, if someone was a Nazi, why should they have stuff named after them? Uh, I think it's a legitimate question. Uh, so that's an aside, but I just thought I should say that. Um, any comments on that or, or anything else so far? No, no comments. So um, this is the deal. I had this formula, more or less, you know, but and so what this is saying is that in orthogonal polynomials, you always have a recursion that's like a two-step recursion, uh, which says that this uh, n plus first polynomial will depend on the nth and then the n minus first. Now, if you add orthog if you add Schefer polynomials as a constraint, then it turns out that this isn't any old constant, but it becomes linear as it is here. L times n plus f n is a linear in n, which is the index for these polynomials. And here it will be quadratic uh, for the second one. And this is very much uh, like in the spirit of the five sum that I talked about, where this n plus first polynomial is dependent not just on the nth, but also on the n minus first. So it's saying like tomorrow depends on today, but also on yesterday. Now, when you look at what depends on today, well, you can kind of get a sense of that by this weight x. There's an x here multiplying times today, but there's no x here. So if you see an x coming up, that means that that was, uh, and I use these letters, l will mean links which is a one-step causality. That's how I interpret it. K will mean kinks, which is like a two-step causality. And then uh, I'll discuss this later. But so the idea was that this recurrence formula, there is a formula for linearization, which means that, um, and this is by us uh, two Koreans, uh, mathematicians, uh, and their last names, but let's get their first names. Their last names are Kim and Zeng. Their first names are... Please, Dong Su Kim and Jang Zhen. Okay, I think they're both Korean. So, a combinatorial formula for the linearization coefficients of general Schefter polynomials, 2001. Very uh, important. I mean, so that saved 
me years of work. All the combinatorics has been done in a certain sense. It could just be interpreted a little bit different, but this huge work, not just the polynomials themselves, but this linearization, basically saying like, and this is a simple version. Uh, let's put these polynomials in context. If they were talk orthogonal polynomials, that means that uh, they have an inner product with regard to which they are orthogonal. That inner product will, um, I can show some examples of what it looks like, but basically you'll be integrating these po 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 polynomials against um, against either uh, a weight function or it'll be an infinite sum. So let's just look at that here. So there's, it turns out to be five kinds. So for example, in the simplest case, Hermite, you'll be integrating against e to the negative x squared dx. Uh, in the Laguerre case, which is like the bound state for the rate, it'll be, you'll be integrating against x to the alpha times e to the minus x. So this one will have a domain uh, from zero to infinity. This one will have from negative infinity to positive infinity. So you get different domains depending on your, uh, what I call the space-time wrapper. But the most general case, it turns out, is the Meixner case. Uh, that's uh, a step function. It's very strange uh, that the most general case is a discrete step function uh, where uh, at each interval, uh, inter integer valued interval from k to k plus one, you change the value uh, that you're integrating against, you're summing against. And this is a step function. And then this one will be in terms of complex numbers, if my eyes don't lie. Yes. So that's where we're headed to. But the idea is that when you take these integrals, which are analytic, uh, but you can get the same answer combinatorially. You can take the x to the n that you're integrating against, and you can say, okay, pull out the symmetric function, symmetric group on n letters, and look at the n factorial permutations, and just run through them all, and add these weights. So take alpha for every time your permutation goes up, like let's, let's say the number one gets sent to seven, maybe the number seven gets sent to 13. So those are two ascending steps. So those would each get a weight alpha, alpha squared, let's say. And then every time it goes down, you give it a weight beta. So if it goes down from seven to nine, I mean, that's up. <laughs> but it goes up from seven to three, that would be, let's say it'd get a beta. Then there may be some fixed points. So maybe two gets sent to two so that it would get a fixed point weight. And then you'd have cycles. So a fixed point is a cycle, but this one wouldn't count um, cycles. Um, but if it was a cycle of length three, then it would get a, a negative value. That's very common. You give a cycle a negative value and be negative gamma over alpha beta. So these alpha beta F gammas, they come in. Can I interrupt? Can you clarify what Please. L of Xn means? Does that mean you're integrating the X, X to the nth power against the space-time wrapper? Yes, so it would be uh, integral of x to the n times weight function, let's say w of x, okay. dx. Right. So weight function might be uh, e to the negative x squared uh, over 2. For so example. these are the moments of the weight function. Yeah, that'd be a good way to say it, moments. And so this is one place where probability uh, statistics comes in right off the bat, because those are, dis those are probability distributions. So, uh, and one question I have uh, that I haven't figured out, um, but um, the question is, if you know, um, let's say the moments, right? Can you give a nice, can you give the form of the integral, right? Like, can you give the form of the uh, distribution from the moments? I think there's something called the Henkel determinant uh, that can do that. You reconstruct it, right? Like, so there should be a nice way to get back that e to the negative x squared. You know, yeah, there's some cl classic theorems and analysis that, that, um, that are relevant there. Um, I could look one up right now if you want. <laughs> yeah, if you if you want to, but okay, more later so, in any time. Okay, but, but basically, right. um, that's something on the. Uh, that's something I don't know. So that's one reason why it's nice to have um, different um, people with different intuitions working on this, right? So um, the point is, it took me like more than a year to find two sources where I could match them up and technically make sure that uh, the coefficients here in this recurrence relation and the coefficients, let's say, for example, in this u prime of t equals one over one minus alpha t, one minus beta t equals, and this is the hard part, a prime of t over gamma t a of t. 
wow, like to know that this gamma is the same as that gamma. And, you know, to get the minus sign correct, to get all that correct, like that took a year just to chase down the papers. Of course, it would take more time to understand what those papers are actually saying. Uh, but that's crucial information combinatorially, but it's very powerful uh, in terms of what we'll be able to do. Now, um, there's two perspectives here. So one perspective is um, in terms of these coefficients as they're written, L, K, F, and gamma. But there's another perspective that's very important for the classification, and that would be uh, in terms of alpha and beta. So alpha and beta are the things that will distinguish in different ways. And um, the very nice relation is that this L, which I call links, equals to minus alpha plus minus beta. And this K, which I relate with kinks, equals to minus alpha times min minus beta. And so um, another way to kind of write it out. Oh, so, so one, one nice formula here is that alpha minus beta squared equals L squared minus 4K. So when they do the um, analysis that leads to the classification, it's really the quadratic equation. And so you can see that the alpha and beta are kind of like solving in a quadratic equation. That quadratic equation, um, it's basically arising from this recurrence, uh, I mean, recur recurrence relation. It turns out when you have a recurrence relation like this, you can kind of solve it using a quadratic uh, expression. Um, if it was a single thing, you would have like powers of R, let's say, or something. But if it's a double thing, then you you use that as a guess solution, and then you get the true solution, and it's quadratic. Uh, that's the best I can say. I have to learn how to do that. But the point is, is that you get this equation, U prime of T equals one over one minus alpha t times one minus beta t. And this is the u of t up here in the exponential. And another way, if you multiply it out, uh, well, negative alpha minus beta, that's our L. And then um, negative alpha times negative beta, that's our k. So, um, oh, and if we solve these quadratic equations that I was talking about, like you could get alpha beta that one way to think of it is alpha plus beta over two. That's the average. That's this L over two. Or it should be probably negative L. I probably got that wrong. And then plus or minus the square root of L squared minus 4K over two. Uh, that would be uh, this alpha minus beta over two. So alpha plus beta over two plus or minus alpha minus beta over two. It either gives you alpha or it gives you beta. So everything's very nice. Now, the crucial thing is, is The thing that allows us to solve it is they get, Meixner gets this equation, Schaeffer also gets it, like u prime of t equals one over one minus alpha t, one minus beta t. Well, combinatorially, that's a very nice thing. Uh, one over one minus alpha t would just be one plus alpha t plus alpha squared t squared plus alpha cubed t cubed, et cetera. And then we get the same uh, analogously for one over one minus beta t, and then we multiply them together. When you multiply them together, this is the kind of thing you get. You get one plus T in its to get a power of T would be either alpha or it'd be beta. To get a power of T squared, then either the one contributes alpha squared or the other contributes beta squared, or they each contribute an alpha and a beta, and so on. So, like if it was T cubed, it'd be alpha cubed plus alpha squared beta plus alpha beta squared plus beta cubed, and just goes on. So here's where the physical interpretation starts to come in. But this is basically the the, the key of the combinatorics. And what it's saying, it's saying that um, uh, I call them particle clocks. Uh, the reason is, is that um, when you have an event, uh, and I can think of like, let's say Feynman diagrams, but um, one of the principles of physics that kind of is suggested by this, um, and not only this, but that really physics never happens in one frame. Physics always happens in pairs of frames. That's what you need for something to happen, basically. And it kind of relates maybe two things happening. You know, that you move from one event to another event. What makes those events maybe different, right? And so um, those events are different uh, because uh, uh, you can take steps alpha from one frame to the other, and you can take steps beta back. So if the total number of steps is, let's say, t to the k, 
then there will be so many steps alpha i, and then there'll be so many steps beta k minus i, and they'll add up to t to the k. And so because uh, you get so many alphas and so many betas and they add up, I kind of think of it as a clock where you're ticking off alpha in one direction, you're ticking off beta in the other direction. So the clock is, but you can think of it as like, a, but clock like it means in the terms of steps, like they're ticks or they're steps or however, uh, it's not clear, but that they're these counting devices. Um, and so what we'll see is that um, we have possible uh, ways of setting alpha and beta. And so here are some of the, here are the ones that are kind of relevant that come up. Then we'll explain why these, uh, or at least uh, here. Okay, so in the most general case, like alpha does not equal to beta, both are real and non-zero. That's the Meixner case, and that looks like this. And so I can... Think of physically like in terms of a scattering model. So uh, you think of particles coming together through an interacting through an interaction potential. And so there's five zones. This number five keeps coming up. So the first zone, they're what physicists call as asymptotically free. They're not affecting each other. And so they have these independent clocks, so to speak. There's these two frames, uh, alpha from the one to the other, beta going back. But then you reset one of the clocks. So let's say beta goes to zero. And so that means maybe it suggests that let's say one of these frames gets uh, hooked into this other frame. They become uh, related. And so the frame that gets related, and it gets, it's not symmetric. One of them goes to zero, not both of them. And so um, it identifies with the other frame. You know, the other frame is maybe not aware. <laughs> uh, so what's happening there is that uh, you're, the wave function arises. So in this model, um, of the, there, there's this reality, and if you saw the video on uh, Schepfer polynomials as combinatorial space, then you know that, okay, the Schepfer polynomial constraint is talking about um, uh, part, part uh, sets, uh, partitions of sets. Um, whereas, um, right, partitions of sets. Whereas, um, I, I have to get jump back into my thought. Okay, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so alpha, comma, beta, that's the Meixner. Uh, so you have two frames. Okay, oh, so you have this global universe or something that's finite, possibly very large, like, you know, 10 to the Google or whatever things, but it's finite. Then, where you know what happens? What the wave function is doing is just really, uh, and what the measurement is interested in, it's interested in a subsystem. That subsystem arises, okay, at a certain point. So, in, 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 originally they're asymptotically free. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that at a certain point uh, the interaction is non-negligible. At that point, that is when the wave function arises from this point of view. Then you are in the interaction. So this clock has been reset, but now. This clock is going to be set along with the other clock. So you go alpha in the one direction, you go alpha in the other one, they're in sync. And that would be uh, in a bound state. Then what happens is that uh, at a certain point, the wave function collapse, which means that something happened. When something happens, you reset the clock, okay? And they go to zero. And then now those clocks are entangled. So you have, uh, they're both complex conjugates, it's alpha and alpha bar. And maybe an important way to think about um, this is that um, what is a step physically? A step is where something did not happen, you see. So with the, regard to the question, John, that uh, you were talking about, and I've spoken with you this before, but um, what combinatorial interpretation allows us to do, it allows us to distinguish between a case where there's an observer or not. And the idea is that when there's an observer, you have the possibility of things not happening. In nature, things are only happening. So the example that I give um, with regard to Pascal's triangle is that you can interpret Pascal's triangle in terms of simplexes, where you're choosing whether or not for a vertex to be in a subsimplex of the simplex. And Pascal's triangle gives you, let's say at level N, it gives you all the ways of, of uh, you could have a subsimplex in a simplex, let's say with, I think it's N vertices, uh, or but it could be empty. It could just be the center of the simplex. 
So that's a syntactic choice. Vertex exists or it does not exist. Maybe they, none of them exist. So things can, you know, or something happened, something did not happen. Whereas if you take a cube and you put it on its corner and you have like up, you know, pairs of directions, like up and down, left and right, forward and backward, those are always a choice that are semantically equal. They're the, you know, or in this, I mean, they're just semantics. Uh, you could relabel them. It does, doesn't matter. They'd label the same. See, the syntactic difference is not about relabeling. If something is and if something isn't, syntactically, it makes a difference. There's a, various technical ways where that comes up, but one is in terms of, I mean, I want to get too technical maybe, but just in terms of properties, when properties don't exist, you treat them differently than when they do exist and stuff like that. I'd have to chase that down. But syntactic difference is different from that. So what that's saying, it's saying that this idea that things are not happening is a common interpretation you can do. And that's what I'm saying is that these particles are doing. So when you talked about having an agency machine, which uh, could be an, an environment where something, you know, where the experiment happened, so to speak. This is kind of like um, almost saying maybe even the opposite, saying that there are perspectives where things are not happening. You see, like when you have an observer, things are not happening. And then you can leave the perspective where things are not happening and end up in a perspective where you're back into nature. So nature, in a certain sense that we're used to, is only the Hermite polynomials. And that's why uh, in quantum field theory, it's all based on, uh, uh, it's all based on um, uh, the a quantum harmonic oscillator, which is all based on the Hermite polynomials. It's all based on the collapsed wave function. It's all based on something having happened, you know, that we measure things when things happen. <laughs> but the idea is that, but there's all these statistics, uh, five zones where, things don't have to be happening. In fact, you're, the statistics are based on like what's not happening. And in different zones, things are not happening in different ways. So any comments here? Or questions? But if not, then I'll continue. Um, so, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I, I've seen this with you before and I'm, I'm still, you know, could you, is there a measurement uh, or some kind of physical process you can go through to uh, go through examples of those five cases, you know, where those five cases happen or those five cases are relevant in, in different regimes? I mean, without having a, a particular physical example or, or physical setup, it's hard for me to get my mind around this. Well, so, um, yeah. It's maybe early for me, but but we're getting closer. I think that's what um, that's what this presentation is about. But so I think the first one to try to do would be to try to say that there's a different way to approach the hydrogen atom, to say that um, you could try to look at the hydrogen atom as a bound state and apply a different combinatorics uh, to uh, looking at it. You see. And so, um, and so, for example, maybe, you know, the bound state perspective with the statistics it has might let you calculate things, for example, about the strong force uh, with, uh, you know, how it stays together. So uh, it, it would just say that you have a different framework in terms of which to uh, do calculations. So what does that mean? I don't, you know, I don't know at this point, but it's just, it's just a saying that that would be the kind of thing that this theory would hopefully open up. Does that help or? Well, it's still pointing right, maybe, maybe, the... maybe to just add that, like right now, I think like everything is based on this idea of the wave function collapsed. But the idea is that, I don't know about measurement, but at least calculation, you could do a calculation in a situation like a bound state where the wave function is not collapsing. The wave function is persisting. It's Absolutely. bound. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that would be uh, that would be maybe different than how things are today. I don't know if that's uh but you could calculate like what is, you know, you could describe what's going on. Now you could take the integral, you know, of something. I don't know. But uh, you know, is that does that count as a measurement? I'm not sure, but um then but, I, at that point I, I lose it. But does so, that I mean, my understanding is that you know that integral gives you would give you the statistics uh, of the measurements that you could perform on a system, you know, the, like the average, for example. Um, and 
but in terms of a particular measurement i don't think quantum mechanics really models that it it just it's just kind of an axiom that you're gonna based on the statistics that comes out of a particular wave function or superposition mm -hmm. you're gonna get um you know when when you do your measurement your measurement will measurements viewed statistically will be consistent with that ca calculation but it doesn't tell you how those how those particular measurements come about it doesn't tell you how how the wave function collapses for example um well, well so other, i mean there is a there is this thing called the spontaneous collapse theory which gives you a little bit more detail about what that what that could look yeah, which like probably i'm sympathetic to right like that under 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 certain conditions things will spontaneously collapse that's right. basically what i'm trying to i mean i would that's i'm sympathetic to that very much right and so maybe this is a maybe this is an unpacking of that theory in in, in a certain sense um like a more detailed version of that. well and so this is so this is saying for example that um it's uh, reconsidering the wave function, saying, first of all, that the wave function is not the whole universe. The wave function is just a tiny subsystem. Yeah. That the wave function arises, that the wave function persists, that the wave function collapses, that the wave function leads to entanglement. And I think that that's all very uh, nice in the sense that it's not like, you know, it kind of gives you a little piece of reality that you can work with, not having to, you know, in it, I think that accords with our understanding of physics in terms of how physicists behave, you know, so, um, and it accords a little bit with what you're saying, like, so it's saying that different statistics give five different space-time wrappers, and so uh, those different statistics depend on what the observer is not observing, <laughs> I mean, because the observer is not, the basic point about the observer is that observer is observing what's not happening. And that's just a purely like it just changes the statistics in certain ways, and it gives you these the alpha and betas are telling you the ways it's uh, it's these clocks. So, um, so why don't I jump to? So I kind of mentioned three parts. Uh, one is that there's these combinatorial objects, these clocks. Um, there's other ways to look at them, but maybe I'll just that'll be enough for now about that. Then uh, there's this uh, integration here, this L, right? So in different ways, this will be integrating in different things. But there's a third component is, well, how does the uh, Hamiltonian work? You know, and that's kind of physical. And that's a, a new thing. A couple of days ago, I just kind of redid and thought about it. I had done something like this before, but I didn't really make sense of it. But now I think I have a sense. So the Hamiltonian, uh, well, okay. So first of all, if we're thinking of our building blocks, and I'm only going to focus on the Hermite polynomials, but if we think about them in terms of having a derivative act on them, right? Having operators act on them. So let's say an operator is a derivative, d dx. Well, in this case, um, and this is what's known as the umbral calculus, the shadowy calculus. It's just very much like if this was a monomial x to the n, because you go down a level to the n minus one, and then you give an integer n in front. So it looks exactly parallel as if this was a derivative of x to the n, you would get n times x to the n minus one. But instead of writing x to the n, you write uh, Hermite polynomial, uh, the nth one, and then the n minus first Hermite polynomial here. So that's how it, so for our point of view, uh, this is working like a lowering operator. It's lowering the degree. In combinatorics, you would have like uh, n bricks. It would be choosing one of those bricks. And so there's n ways to do that. And you're left with n minus one bricks. So, or cells or whatever you have. Then you can multiply by x, x times h sub e of x. And then uh, that equals to this. Uh, you go up a layer, and then you have what we had over here. You have this derivative, or you have this lower layer. And that's because uh, of the recurrence relation, which looks like this, that the n plus first equals x times uh, the nth one minus n times n minus first one. So if you re rearrange this, you can see what the effect of putting this x up here is. So this is saying that we have a lowering operator and we have a raising operator. You know, if you multiply by x, you're going to go up uh, plus some lower terms. I'm, I'm confused. So, yeah. Anders, H, does H mean the Hamiltonian in this case, or does H 
have to do with Hermite? Oh, H is the Hermite uh, polynomial. I'm sorry. And these are so probably H, H E E H E sub N, right? Okay, all right. Okay. And those are the Hermite polynomials. These are the probabilistic Hermite polynomials. Um, so X times uh, the Hermite polynomial N of X equals the N plus first Hermite polynomial plus uh, N times the N minus first Hermite polynomial. So maybe another way to think about it is that the nth Hermite polynomial is a polynomial of degree N. Uh, and so uh, by multiplying by X, it becomes a polynomial of degree N plus one. By taking the derivative, it becomes a polynomial of degree n minus one. Just okay. to be to be clear here, these are not the Hermite functions with the space time wrapper included. These are no, the that's polynomials. right. These are the Hermite polynomials, right? And so then I'm looking at let's say something that would be like the wave function, where I take the Hermite polynomial and then I add this space time wrapper. Uh, in the case of the probabilistic ones, you'd use the minus x squared over four. Uh, and that's the square root of minus x squared over two. So that's what you use. And then there would be a constant in front. And maybe the x would be actually a constant times x. You know, there's different things you could do. But basically, what happens when you hit it with a Hamiltonian? Well, that Hamiltonian will be like a constant times the second derivative with regard to x and a constant times x squared. So you hit it here. And you get this whole chain reaction because you're taking two derivatives. But a lot of things cancel out. So let's look and we'll reinterpret what the Hamiltonian actually does. So the derivative of this H, well, we just talked about that. The, 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 the first derivative uh, will yield this. So that gives me, um, oh, but see, I have two things. I can differentiate the polynomial or I can differentiate what I call the mother function. If I differentiate the polynomial, then I get what I just was explaining, n times you know the thing lowered. If I differentiate the mother function, well, that's just uh, the same thing times the derivative of negative x squared over 4, which is uh, negative x over 2, right? So notice here, and this is where the combinatorics will kind of like say like, you know, we're talking about derivatives, but really when we take the derivative of the mother function, you know, times this, it's just a fancy way of multiplying by x. Okay, multiplying by negative x over 2. You see, but it's really a raising operator, right? Times a constant, right? So, yeah, you can talk about derivatives, but if you wanted to, you could just say, no, there's this raising operator. So you can lower it, you can raise it. Now, uh, or you can multiply by x squared, which is like raising it twice. Now you continue. So now you're taking a derivatives of this term. So if you lower it again by taking the derivative, okay, it'll be to the n minus two. Or you could hit it with the mother function, but that raises it. So then that'll raise it. So you lowered it and you got the n, but then you raised it, you got this negative x over two. Now, if you derivative, if you differentiate this one, if you differentiate the, oh, if you differentiate, hmm, okay. Oh, now you have three terms. Yes. If you differentiate the, this H, you will get an N times that X over two, and it'll drop, it'll lower, right? If you differentiate the x over two, you'll get this one half. If you differentiate the mother function, you'll get this, uh, it'll raise it again, right? So now you have like six different contributions. Now what happens here? Well, some of them have lowered, some of them have raised. The ones that have lowered, when we do the, um, when we go back and we're going to hit it with another, we're going to go back, we're going to hit it with another uh, function, right? This will be this another Hermite uh, polynomial times um, another wave function, basically. If, but this will be on the nth degree if we're working with pure states. So if it got lowered, it'll go to zero. You know, it'll go, it'll vanish. So the ones that got lowered will vanish. This one will vanish. We don't have to worry about that one. Now here, this is lowered, but the X raises it. So we have to worry about that. This one ended up the same. This one got raised, 
and this one got raised. Now, if it got raised, it may have lower terms, right? Because uh, x squared h sub e, I mean, Hermite uh, nth times nth, nth Hermite polynomials, when you write that out, it'll be the n plus second Hermite polynomial, and there may be lower order terms. And then one of them may resonate with this e to the n. But you see, we have chosen the potential, or nature chose the potential, who, you know, God chose the potential so that it would exactly cancel out. Okay. So that's one thing is that you have all this complicated analysis, but the point is that it's very precisely chosen. And if it was a little bit off, it would not cancel out. It has to exactly cancel out, right? So that's kind of interesting math way. Like, is that really physically real? They just these things just don't exist. This was chosen. The whole potential, this everything here is kinematic. Uh, the potential is here, and the potential is exactly what it would need to be to get rid of that highest term. So we're left with these guys. So this one will stay. Now, what about these guys? Um, x times h sub e n minus 1 of x. Well, uh, if you take the derivative of the x over 2, I'm sorry, if you take the derivative of, um, oh, I messed up. There should be three derivatives here because you got an x term and but anyways, if you take the derivative of the x, it'll just lower it. That will vanish. If you take the derivative, like I did here, of the n minus 1, that'll lower it further. That'll vanish. Yeah, it won't be able to climb back up. It'll get complicated. You'll need to, uh, n minus 2, you'll need to. But it's it's going to vanish out of sight. The same for this one. This is These two ended up being the same by different routes. The only way it can persist is if, you go back up, you know, so you, oh, oh, no, 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 oh, no derivative being taken here, I'm just telling myself, you already took two derivatives, now we're just trying to uh, simplify what happens when x times h e, e here, so um, x times h e sub n minus one, like we had up here, it gives you two terms, right? So it'll raise it up. That's what I did here. It'll raise it up, and it raises it up here, and the x goes away. Or it will um, go down. Okay, so I, I did no mistake here. This is correct. We're not differentiating anything here. So there's not nothing addition. So this will just be n minus 1. We multiply by n minus 1 here. Right? Does this make sense, John, or are you kind of following? But these guys will vanish, these lower. So we're left with three terms. And they're all the same. They're h sub h uh, hermite, the nth hermite polynomial. You have a negative one half here, a negative n over two, negative n over two. This is a very convoluted long way to say that what we did really, we had raising operator and lowering operator. So, and you see, when we raise, this is all about the compartments. If you remember the last video where we had uh, the Sheffer polynomials, this combinatorial space, and the roles of these compartments, what this is doing is basically saying, uh, and let's look at this one because this is most illustrative. It's saying we created, by, by di differentiating the mother function, we created a compartment. But then by differentiating this compartment, we removed a compartment. And so we ended up here right, which is this. Now, so what we did was we applied a raising operator, and then we applied a lowering operator, and then we got uh, we got this. Now, we could have done, and Thomas mentioned this, because I, I had kind of messed up this. I did read, had to redo it. You can lower first. So if you lower first, you take the derivative here, and then you can raise it. Okay, so if you lower it and raise it, you end up here, or if you raise it and lower it here. What does that mean? Let's say I have n cells and so many compartments, right? I have n elements in, in so many compartments. Okay, I can add a compartment, and I can take away that new compartment. That's this one. Or I have already n elements. I could take away... There's n ways I could take an, a compartment away, let's say. That would be these. Although I'm not sure they're compartments, but hmm. Or I could take away, I could add a compartment, and then, uh, I mean, I could take away a compartment, and then there would be like n ways to. 
Oh, there's n ways to add a compartment. That's what I'm saying. I can add a compartment. Oh, but there's, I'm not sure this. Oh, there's n elements I could take away. So there's n elements I could, I'm not, but I have to also take away a compartment. Hmm, I'll have to think about that. And then I can, I can, add, I can take away a compartment and then add one. I'm not going to try to figure this out. But basically, you get n negative n over two minus n over two minus one half. You get what you should get, which is um, negative n minus one half. You know, you get n plus one half times h omega, whatever the constants are, right? But all this other stuff vanishes. Some vanishes stuff because it's too low. Some vanishes because the high stuff vanishes because it matches the potential. And just this stuff comes. And the stuff that came, and I would have to now rework this because I realize like I, it's, con I'm confused and I'm not sure if the combinatorics matches up. But the gist is, is that it looks like you're adding the minimal compartment, which would be X, and then removing it. Or you're removing a compartment and you're adding it. So it would be what I call a quantum perturbation. And so like um, in quantum field theory, it would be like uh, raising operators and lowering operators. Although that's also used for the quantum harmonic oscillator. Like, you know, you can, you raise and lower or you lower and raise and you sum that, that would be the, the uh, commutator, right? And so uh, when you do the commutator and act on it, like you, that's the question, like what happens when you do that, right? So this is a way of saying, uh, that's what the Hamiltonian is. It's raising and lowering followed by, let's say, lowering and raising. Um, and so it's this tiny perturbation where like you do the least thing possible and to try to get back to where you were, but you see what effect it has. And the effect, the expected effect it has is the energy. So you see, the idea is that, so several things pop out of this calculation in terms of what the Hamiltonian is. It's like there's a way to combinatorially think of the Hamiltonian and I have to see that I have to kind of figure this out because obviously I'm not getting it right. Um, but um, there's a way of doing the combinatorial where you can just do it combinatorially. You don't need all this math. Second of all, you can do it as if you were acting on the Hermite polynomial and not on any of this uh, extra mother function. The mother function is really, from my point of view, it's just there so that when you take the derivative of it, it could act as a raising operator, you see. But if you have a raising operator, then you don't need this uh, to do it so strangely. But even if you do it so strangely, at least you get an interpretation that differentiating the space-time wrapper is somehow raising the, you know, raising the thing. So raising the level, whereas differentiating the thing inside is lowering the level. So, and then it also says that the whole notion of potential energy is kind of fictitious from this point of view. It just is what it needs to be for the particular space-time wrapper for the higher order kinematics to just cancel away. So this is, I, got, I, I kind of like uh, some of this idea, like I kind of kicked in with me a couple days ago. That's why I was kind of excited about this. But so these are the three elements uh, that I've been trying to say, that there's a way to build the combinatorial objects. Either they look like uh, combinations of those particle clocks, because maybe to go back here, um, You know, and there's another comment I want to make too. So, you know, the comment twist is generated by this, but where is this? Um, this is in the exponential, you know, e to the x u of t. So each compartment x is going to have with it a particle clock. And then furthermore, there's another kind of thing that's not compartments, but it has similar combinatorics to the common to the clock, but it'll have lots of compartments of its own. Um, it can have lots of particle clocks, not just one, because it is also, and this is an important point, A of T equals E to the gamma V of T, where, um, and I, I don't know if I did this computation with you, I certainly did it with Thomas, but I just want to show, when we go here, here is it, here. So Meixner gives this formula, okay? So now once we are happy with this formula, U prime of T is clear, but now how do we, you know, if we have A prime of T over gamma T, A of T, we can write it like this, that it's one over gamma T times the derivative of log of A of T, right? And if you take the derivative, you'll get A prime of T over A of T. So we can write it like this, right? 
But that means that um, AF, what does that mean? Oh, but we means that this all equals to one over, you know, one plus T, we have this infinite series, right? So this thing, one over gamma T derivative of log of A of T equals this infinite series. So then what we can do is we can multiply that infinite series by gamma T. Well, if I multiply T, I get this V of T. Uh, so that's one half T, no, I'm sorry, I get this V prime of T, what I call, I get this T plus T squared. Then we can multiply that by gamma. Then we can integrate both sides. So I get the integral of V prime of T. It'll be the V of T plus a constant, but the constant I think is zero. And then, uh, or maybe it's one. I have to be careful about that. I have to double check that. I think, it, but, um, and then you um, take that, you, because it has a log, you take the exponential. So you get E to the gamma V of T. So that says that A of T equals E to the gamma of this whole infinite series, you see, which is very closely related to what we had before, a little bit different combinatorics, but basically closer. It doesn't have the X's, it has an extra T. So we can write our Sheffer thing as it is down here, uh, E to the gamma V of T plus X U of T. So the A of T now is exponential because of the orthogonality constraint, we have pushed it up to the exponential. Now it's very similar to the phase factor where you would have like a I times um, E times T plus X times P. P is momentum, E is energy. So that suggests that U of T could be the momentum. A v of T could be the um, uh, energy and gamma could be the time. So gamma is counting the cycles, you know, here. Okay, it's basically the cycles. And so how many cycles you have? So each particle clock would equal basically uh, one cycle. Uh, and so it's counting the particle clocks. Uh, so that's kind of curious, uh, interesting. Whereas X is given by the compartments. So these things like are starting to have combinatorial interpretation, things like momentum, energy, uh, X, and you know the one dimension space and T. Uh, and then, um, so to put it all together, we have combinatorial objects. Oh, I'll show, I was talking about alpha and beta, but there's another way to think about it in terms of L and K, and the picture isn't exactly correct, but it's, it's alpha and beta would happen in a certain order, but L and K, L equals negative alpha or negative beta. K equals, let's say, negative alpha times negative beta. And so I don't know exactly how to draw these, but the idea is that this is kind of like a links and kinks. It's like a single causality, like a double causality. Like, but this is kind of like commutative. This is kind of like non-commutative. So there's these two different ways to think about it. And you get combinations of these things. Or another way to write this, this is a... This is a uh, circle way to write it, but you can also write it as growing trees. And some of these trees will have double roots and some of them will have single roots. So where it was a fixed point in the permutation, it would have a single root. These can be sent to zero, but these are the double roots. Any points or questions here so far? So, but maybe just to conclude what I've said so far um, to say that um, the combinatorial objects are can be read uh, the um, linearization or integration can be done. The Hamiltonian operator can be interpreted. And so we have the building blocks for actually trying to fit everything together. Um, John, Thomas, any thoughts? I hope it works out because some things seem to be missing to connect to how I would describe it or con understand it. But I'm uh -huh. eagerly waiting for the final or rather the next step so that I might jump onto it too. It's oh, exciting. Yeah. John? So, so um, there was a, there was a, at some point there's a link between U and A. And that, does that come from the orthogonality? No, that's exactly from the Sheffer. So A of T and E to the X U of T is imposed by the Sheffer. The orthogonality then further says that, well, A of T will also have to be exponential. I see. That's what this is concluding. You know, that it, it'll have to look like E to the gamma V of T. Yeah. 
And I haven't seen anybody emphasize that, you know, like I think, but I think the math is just seems straightforward. I mean, we went over that. I don't see how else to, <laughs> I don't see where I'm going wrong. Uh, and that it's very beautiful. And exponentials, you know, are combinatorially what exponentials are doing. They're kind of like saying, like, take this object and then combine it, you know, assemble it amongst itself as many times as you like, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. kind of like what the exponential is doing. But it's saying that there's these two kinds of objects. And so uh, this whole idea, like Fourier transforms, you know, it's at Laplace transforms. It's interesting, like Meixner used the Fourier transform, Laplace transform at some point of his work uh, to kind of show something, I don't know, at the very end. Uh, so maybe um, to look at that paper, but but that form is very uh, intriguing um, here, that it all just shoves up to the exponential. Hmm. And I think it's nice that like uh, it does kind of ring with some of the things that you were saying in the beginning. That's why I was glad that we could start with that because uh, because it's saying that these statistics exist in different ways, you know. And then uh, it, it, but it almost seems almost the reverse of what you were saying. Like there's the 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 most of the physics is things not happening. You <laughs> see, like. Our physicists only focus on the things that happen, you know, and the statistics of what happened. That's all they know. So, so they only focus on the moment of collapse. But that's where the things happen. And but, uh, but elsewhere, um, and so Are in you... the moment of collapse, the two frames have zero difference. Basically, the two frames are you know are separated by zero, you know, in both directions. So, but then the clock is reset. That's how I understand it. So. And also, I, I was telling, I think like, you know, Minkowski space time has to come in somewhere, but um, I think it comes, I hope it comes in through this fixed point, uh, F, uh, if it's non-zero, that, that would mean translations, because, you know, you can do translations uh, of X through this F. They typically set this to zero. Then you only get permutations that don't have fixed points, you know, where there are they're, uh, they're, uh, no fixed points. But so uh, somehow, the Lorentz transformation somehow could relate to that, what happens when you translate with this. And then another thing that's crucial maybe to add uh, that I've told you before, but this all lifts up to quantum field theory potentially because, uh, um, well, because Wick's theorem talks about uh, the combinatorics of these raising and lowering operators and it uses uh, what we use for Hermite polynomials because it's the exact same combinatorics for Hermite polynomials, which is given here, where you have these uh, transpositions, you have these links. So that would be the um, thing that um, Wick's theorem uses. And that would be for the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is exactly what the Hermite polynomials deal with. So lifting it up to quantum field theory would suggest that, uh, so then it would suggest that in the Feynman diagrams, uh, the Feynman diagrams work for that case, but we would extend the Feynman diagrams to deal with kinematically more complex things where in between interaction points, there are these clocks that could be ticking off things not happening. And that would give you the statistics for the different things. Hmm. So I think that's the most of it. Uh, oh, and then but just to say like, you know, there's all this other stuff I've maybe shown before, but like, like, you know, for the moments, you know, that all these things give wonderfully beautiful answers for the moments. Uh, well, so here is like, you know, for the different uh, versions of one over one minus alpha T, one of his beta T, you get different uh, specializations and you get, um, you get these different uh, functions to integrate in order to get U of T or A of T. But um, uh, so that's how you can get those. Um, this is beautiful uh, that you get the uh, different space-time wrappers, but what's very interesting is that these are uh, discrete. The, the most general case, Meixner case, is a discrete strep function. And it's very interesting why you get a continuous uh, ones for the very most special cases. And the logic is kind of like this, that uh, the whole system is moving, I guess. So you have this global universe, whatever. Uh, the idea is it does a subsystem popped out. 
the two frames are moving with respect to each other in a certain sense by alpha minus beta. You know, there's a step alpha in one direction, step beta in another direction. Somehow like alpha minus beta is how they relate. And um, so alpha minus beta, if it's non-zero, you know, everything is fine. It kind of, it does its job. But the point is, is at a certain point, like let's say beta gets set to zero, the two frames become in contact. You know, at least one gets in contact with the other, it goes to zero, and now it synchronizes with the other one. So now, so when they go to zero, uh, the step function degenerates a little bit. Uh, but the whole subsystem has been the maybe how to say the the virtual subsystem has been moving alpha minus beta. But when the wave function arises, the clock gets reset. They're in sync. Now it has its own time inside somehow, like it has its, and so it's not moving. It's not moving anywhere. And so in the bound state, because it's not moving, alpha minus beta is zero. Um, you know, it has to simplify these things. You're not allowed to divide by alpha minus beta. And so the whole thing smooths out. You know, you get infinitely many steps. It's not, see, if it was moving, it would keep shifting. But if it's, in, if it's located, then you just kind of smooth out as much as you like. You go to infinity and you get smooth. When you reset to zero, you get smooth. But when you um, when you start, you know, when the subsystem doesn't exist anymore, as such, it's moving again. But now it's moving circularly. If you if you analyze this out, it's actually moving at a circular angle instead of moving like linear steps. Uh, that I've maybe I won't show now, but that'll show it. A, that's a calculation. So I think I've said just about everything oh maybe i'll just show um i'll just show some of these moments because it's just so pretty these different possible numbers uh, oh here for the commutator i think i was studying this this is kind of basically the same thing i had kind of noticed before that you know about this connection with raising and lowering i won't try to understand it now but but uh that it gives you that's where this thing pops out from doing this raising and lowering kind of because like when you when you it's square to n square to n plus one the things shift the counting kind of shifts i won't try to unpack that here oh here are these numbers so for example those permutations how can they be interpreted in the most general case it's ordered set partitions of n but it could be then set partitions of n, then it could be permutations of n, then it could be permutations of n where you only have transpositions, then it could be these things called zigzag permutations of 2n, kind of like maybe kink. So, so you get all these very famous combinatorial numbers in each case. You get all these probability distributions that are very famous. Uh, every, what not to like, uh, it's all... So maybe any last comments on this? Or any? I'm still, to some extent, hoping for getting a better understanding, but I'm sure if I listen long enough and you make I'll more progress, much. I will follow and be able to follow. Yeah, it's, yeah, there's, there's some unpacking that I'm going to need and all this stuff. Yeah. For example, you know, the, at the combinatorial level, I still don't. I still don't understand what these com the you mean by these local clocks, uh, particle clocks. Um, there's also, you know, I have to admit that as you're going through, I'm not not necessarily absorbing all the steps here. I mean, I that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I understand the raising and lowering, you know, and I understand the collapsing that's going on, you know, in the in this diagram here, uh, you know, not not in detail, but in general. Uh, you know, I've had some experience with that, but um, I mean, the contention is that uh, is your contention that that when you do um, standard quantum mechanics, you're actually missing a lot of things that is uh, that uh, that are collapsing uh, things that you say that don't happen. Is that what you mean? Well, several things. So maybe a couple, like, so with this diagram, one of the points is that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just doing, I'm just trying to model what, what is known, you know, and so these things are apparently known. So I'm trying to, you know, rethink some of these things. But in this rethinking, 
it just looks like uh, the way that is traditionally done, the analytic way, has a lot of baggage that may be uh, just not necessary, not helpful. You know, like all these things that cancel out, maybe they're just not real. You know, like the potential. If the potential is such that uh, it, it its purpose is to cancel out the higher order kinematic terms, you know, then why think of it as real? Why not just say that um, you know it's just not there? It's just part of the space time wrapper. Um, then the other, so to say that you can get the exact same thing if you look at it simpler in combinatorial things, and if you get to the point, the point is that uh, Hamiltonian and the energy are all about um, doing this quantum perturbation where you do the raising and lowering or the lowering and raising and then see what happens. So if that's the point, you can have the Schrodinger equation, which apparently does the same thing, but you don't have to do it. I mean, that just seems like a completely um, historically way we got there, but not really the helpful way to do it in the 23rd century. So, um, and then the other contention is that uh, uh, this suggests that there are these four other zones, five zones in all, you know, where physics could be conceived uh, and where statistics would be different. And then so, and those four zones are where things do not happen. And we can talk about the physics of things that don't happen, which is very interesting. Uh, and going back to that Judea Pearl's counterfactuality, like didn't happen here, didn't happen there. Well, that's an important part about being able to talk about causality, modeling causality is to be able to explain like what didn't happen. Um, that's be just fantastic. So it would, and the, I, the hope would be that it would allow us to discuss physics in situations like with the uh, strong force, you know, where things are bound together in some impenetrable way, uh, where it, we could say that uh, it is uh, ex at least we can model it, what, we're, what we can expect about it. Uh, even if we can't measure it, we can model it, then we can maybe measure secondary things. Maybe the only things we can measure are when we have the collapse, uh, but that we can model all the ways you get to that collapse. Uh, then um, maybe for another time or for this time, but a beautiful thing about Meixner's paper, uh, he seemed much more understandable to me, at least in, you know, his notations seem much more uh, to the point. Uh, but he shares in common with Sheffer, what they do is that they take this U of S, they look at a formal power series that would be the inverse of it. Then uh, they apply a T of D equals derivative plus T2 derivative squared, or they insert a, a differentiative operator, let's say DDX. Then they apply it in this way, and then they get this beautiful result uh, where T of D equals E to the alpha minus beta times the derivative operator minus one over E to the alpha minus beta D derivative minus beta. So this alpha minus beta is this very important step operation. Uh, and so this is just a very simple formula. But like if you look at the Hermite case and what we are doing here, in that case, T of D is just D. Right, because like derivative, I mean, I think that must be true. So what is true? Because U of T, U of S is just S in the Hermite case. So then you just get D. So this is the way to extend uh, things in the more general than the Hermite case. You get a U of S, which extends the function, the variable S. And so then you need to have this T of D, uh, this T that kind of extends it. And then you get this formula, which, and so what does this formula physically mean? I don't know, uh, but that's the thing to kind of, uh, well, physically it means this. It's, this is what is needed to, uh, this is the operator that in that umbral calculus that takes your, that works as the lowering operator, basically, like the differentiation. So T of D is the lowering operator. And then the, the raising operator would be maybe, integrating against the relevant um integrating the relevant um integrating against the relevant uh, space-time wrapper presumably anybody left with me no oh, no i'm still here um okay so so that would be something to explore with me, so John. This is, uh, sorry, you said this is from Mike Meixner's paper. This this uh, yeah inverse, oper uh, inverse operation T. And Sheffer does it too, but he does it kind of more algebraically. Uh, Meixner does it in a kind of more elegant way, uh, I guess. Um, and so it's the, it's in my terminology, it'd be the lowering operator. You know, in the way that the differentiation here is the lowering operator, right? It's the exact same lowering operator. 
I think that's what I'm, but you see now you have to add all these. So in physics, these will be like the interaction terms. So one of the things it's kind of saying is saying like, you know, instead of just having a direct uh, effect, you have all these kind of interaction terms that go off infinity. Now, a beautiful thing about this T of D physically and a beautiful thing about this theory in general is that uh, it sidesteps all of the renormalization issues. So for, because, uh, you know, we're dealing with a finite universe, so you can't get infinite uh, integrals and stuff. But if you look at this T of D, it looks like an infinite series, but think about it. Like if it's acting on a finite polynomial, well, a finite polynomial only, you know, of degree N only has N derivatives, right? Then they all go to zero. So this is kind of like an expanding. It's a self, it's a naturally expanding uh, series, which is always actually in practice finite. It's only as big as the poly polynomial it needs to differentiate, you see? So that's a very handy thing in physics where you're saying you don't have to have uh, true infinite things. You can have these things that as, inf as, as big as you need, as hmm. big as you need, which is much smaller than infinity. So you won't get renormalization problems with something that's as big as you need. It's like a measuring tape, let's say, a differentiating, you know, you, you get as long as you need. So that's exciting. Um, hmm. And that it has this, no, I mean, this notion of this inter self interactions that, you know, like you affect your field, your field affects you back, you affect your field again, you know, in a diminishing, you know, so it's in terms of the derivatives. So again, I look for examples and, you know, if we just apply this to simple harmonic oscillator, you know, quantum... In the harmonic oscillator, it would just be D uh, because U of S is just S. So... Ah, gotcha. But see, so what this is doing is that it's making things look like the harmonic oscillator by including enough interaction as needed. You know, so it gives you an infinite, it gives you an infinite series, but then in practice, you only use a finite amount of that infinite series. Because the, because if you have a finite polynomial, then it, you only need finite number of terms to differentiate it. And what do these particle clocks look like in the case of the harmonic oscillator? What do... Uh, they don't, they don't, um, uh, they're trivial then, because uh, in that case, uh, alpha and beta are both set to zero. And so one thing we can look at, like we can look at linearization when alpha and beta are set to zero. Uh, see, this looks like it'll all go away because, you know, every permutation, well, what happens is that, um, and I didn't maybe write it very well, but alpha and beta, like if you have a cycle, this is saying that in any cycle, except, okay, if you have a fixed point, you'll have a, well, these fixed points will go to zero, basically. I think what one way to think about it, like, basically, like, if you have only, if you have a transposition, you will have one ascension, one descension, but these will divide out by this uh, because a cycle, because it will be a single cycle. So it'll be a single cycle with an alpha beta on top and an alpha beta on bottom and an alpha beta on top. They'll cancel out. So those will survive. Anything that's made up of transpositions will survive. Anything else will go to zero because if it has a cycle that's too long, it'll have too many alpha betas. And if alpha and beta are both zero, you see it'll, you won't be able to do that. You have to have as few alpha betas as possible. Um, but you're also, I think if you have a if you have a fixed point, then you have the problem that you can't have fixed points because then you'll have alpha, alpha and beta won't exist, but you'll have uh, you'll be one over zero. So that now maybe you could have alpha a fixed point way out a cycle i have to think about that a little bit more we were looking at this with um, thomas but that's the kind of thing that happens i guess maybe enough said about this i don't know if that helps oh uh, well yeah i mean i i think i need to understand that formula better to understand right you know, I, mean, I can look at the particle clocks. Uh, particle clocks. I mean, that, I think that to me, that's the big hang up here is that that combinatorial con connection is, is not clear to me. Um, so, so, so in the particle clocks, okay, so like what happens is that when alpha and beta are zero, the only thing are left would be like negative X here, right? T. And then maybe let's say T squared gamma, right? Well, this would be, anyways, these would be like, uh, transpositions, pairs of stuff, 
this would be like fixed points. So when you go to what the Hermites look like, which was here, you have fixed points with X survive, and then you have pairs of links. Uh, you know, like so. So in the case, if you have one cell, you can put an X in. If you have two cells, you can put in an X in each cell, or you could have uh, two cells linked with a transposition or with a link. You know, each has weight I, I times I is negative one. So you get X squared minus one. If there were three cells, you there's three ways of putting in a, a link of two cells, and those will get weight minus three. So there'd be negative three X. And then there's one way to have all three filled with X's. So these are the types of objects that are end if your particle clocks are trivial. But for the other statistics, you would have more complicated things where um, the possibilities would be, this would be the most general, alpha and beta, but it could be alpha and then these could go to zero, which would mean there'd be only alpha with no betas, okay? Or it could be you have beta equal alpha, in which case you would have alphas from two different contributions. Or it could be alpha and alpha bar, you know, alpha conjugate. Uh, so that would be uh, uh, the entangled case. I think my Wi-Fi is ending, but I think I've said enough for this time. Any concluding remarks? I just maybe want to, and then I'll just say a quick I think the, prayer. The moving parts are, are a little bit clearer to me. It, how they all co connect together is is still a, a bit mysterious, you know? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's enough here to warrant some major unpacking, I think. So I'll be writing more technical papers. Maybe I'll do one on the Hermite polynomials, like the whole, you know, what are the common toys of the Hermite polynomials in this point of view? And then just kind of keep proceeding, like doing different parts. That'd probably be a good, that'd probably be a good uh, zeroth order case to, yeah. to at least, at least familiarize, you know, for me to familiarize myself with, with the different moving parts here, that, that would, that'd be very helpful. Thomas, any comments to end with? I would say I need also time, like John, but I have the advantage that you tell it directly to me and then I, it's easier to ask questions and to try to follow. So I'm at an advantage. I'm glad about yeah, it. Thank, thank you, Thomas, for the rehearsal today. <laughs> and thank you both for all the meetings I've gotten to have with you. It's a pleasure. And so thank you for inspiring me, John, especially for getting to think about quantum physics. You know, I never would have dared to work on this. I only dared because uh, I had the chance to spend time with you, you know, old friend. So I thought that would be exciting. And Griffiths, thank you to Griffiths for such a wonderful book that kind of let us just jump right into this uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, calculate. So that's maybe my prayer of thanks to God for uh, having great friends, uh, getting to be the person I am and getting inspired to be the, you know, both of you get to inspire me to be who I am. I wish I had the effect likewise on you uh, and that we we do this publicly to say this is an open thing. I think that we, this is the world we want, I think. Amen. Yeah. This has okay. been Math for Wisdom. Um Goodbye. Are, are you gonna are you gonna stop the recording or should I? Yeah, I'll stop it here. Uh okay. all right. And my screen is seemingly frozen. I don't know how this was you, but I don't see any. This is Andrus Kulikauskas. Thank you for joining us. And uh please go to mathforwisdom.com uh to participate in our discussion group. Uh like this video. Subscribe to these videos, support me through Patreon, uh, and thank you uh, for everything you do.